Hi, I'm Simon Roderick from Fram Search. I'm delighted to be joined today by Keith Grindley from Macro Thoughts. Keith, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. The rain's finally arrived, so. Well, I'm delighted to ask you because I'm kind of a, a you know a temperate climate creature. So for me, it's probably been a bit too hot over the summer. Yeah. Um, so I'm very glad to see it arrive. Right. Keith, before we start, there's lots to unpick from this month's Macro Thoughts. Um, would you mind giving people that are watching a brief overview of your career? My career, uh, I was a um, self-side um, desk manager and trader for UBS, Dresdner um, and the likes. I then moved to the buy side. I ran Global Macro for JP Morgan through the financial crisis. And more recently, over the last six years, um, we've been, uh, it's now actually our anniversary um, of running Macro Thoughts, which is a strategy company to help companies, uh, other industries or hedge funds uh, tackle the problems and issues that financial markets can, are throwing at them. Okay, so there's lots to unpick from this month's uh, summary, um, but obviously it's quite energy focused this month, I mean, for obvious reasons. You know, I think mm -hmm. all over the world, you know, people are talking about energy prices. I was in Norway a couple of weeks ago, and obviously Norway you know, is, is rich in gas and oil, and even there, electricity prices are going through the roof. So you're talking about you know, CPI potentially going to 18 or 20%, and a lot of, a lot of that figure is driven by the energy prices. So how are we going to deal with it? I mean, are we going to go down the French route or are there other solutions? Well, 18 to 20% is, is the market kind of view from, from a lot of the banks at the moment. Um, we're not so uh, aggressive in that nature because we think that the dampening of growth will, that will, will take this off. We always, we've been saying now, uh, well, we, we first, uh, discussed higher inflation two years ago um, and we said then that as inflation rises growth will be dampened and it's supply that's causing the inflation shock and, and not demand. Demand will cause the growth shock. So we're now at the point where um, we're probably at the third phase of inflation, the first being the recovery and the sh supply chain, the second being corporate profits and now we're getting wage demand and it's those wage demands that are the scary part of, of the next six to, six to 12 months. But certainly energy is, is the big issue, it's the headline news across. Um, and yes, uh, the Ukrainian war and conflict has caused problems, is causing problems. Um, slowly, I think there's been some um, movement in that you know, Europe is, is building up its gas, gas supplies um, up until recent weeks, uh, oil prices have come down. The unfortunate thing for the UK is that oil prices, or oh, that wasn't reflected in petrol prices at the pumps until sort of July into August. Whereas in the US, um, as WTI oil peaked around 120, um, immediately the US saw uh, changes of gasoline prices. And obviously, gasoline or energy costs coming down will have a greater impact on inflation than interest rates. For us, the interest rates, rising interest rates or aggressively rising interest rates um, have a limited uh, scope to solve the inflation problem. Uh, and of course, they create inflation in themselves in that as you raise um, mortgage rates, the, the rent rates go up, um, less affordability for mortgages themselves. Uh, it creates an issue of uh, lowering uh, business investment and government investment. It increases uh, government spending, uh, which means obviously that they, they have less ability to, to help um, those that, or the economy itself at a time when uh, energy bills now in the UK are expected to rise above 5,000 pounds, for example. Um, so yeah, we, we raising interest rates uh, serves the purpose of dampening uh, demand, but when you're raising energy prices by uh, and cost of living by, by such a, an extent, then uh, I think the demand is going to drop off anyway. So Demand's cold anyway. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you, Keith. I mean, coming back to the wages point that you make, you know, I, I remember listening to announcements from Andrew Bailey at the time, you know, urging companies to show restraint on pay rises. I remember sitting there thinking, well, actually, this is already happening. 
you know, yeah. wage settlements are already going up significantly. I mean, Fram obviously focuses on financial services, and I think probably the average uplift we're seeing on basic salaries is about 23%, but we've had far, far higher in terms of offers. Yeah. And that's not so those offers are always accepted mm -hmm. because candidates have so many opportunities now. So I think the, uh, you know, it, we're, we're trying to close the stable door off. The, the wage horse has, has bolted to an extent. Um, and interesting as well, you talk about, you know, Europe trying to increase its storage capacity or to certainly have, I think the target from the EU is about 80% storage capacity on gas. Does that distort the market at all? Well, a lot of the gas now is coming through the UK and, and funny enough, the, the UK was a net exporter of energy in the first half of the year. Um, and maybe that's something or a trend that will continue. Um, and there's now issues about the quality of the energy that's being passed back up the pipes that were previously coming into the UK. Um, so yeah, the UK is gaining um, energy from the US. The US is probably the, or the greatest or the largest um, exporter of energy now. Uh, and obviously Qatar is an energy provider, gas provider as well. So yeah, I think that Europe has issues uh, and Germany are, are moving towards uh, turn the lights out in, in commercial buildings overnight and that sort of thing. Um, again, OPEC are now talking about tight or raising um, prices again, uh, which is not good for the global, global economy or growth. Uh, but if Iran, Iran can come to an agreement, um, they can cover the Russian or most of the Russian uh, energy supply. Um, and I think that if, if we can, a lot of speculative money has gone into energy over the last, you know, especially over the last month or so, then you know, if, if governments can, there's a G20 in November, if governments can get together in some way and control energy prices, or individually control energy prices, then the inflation issue can be uh, contained. Uh, and that's why, you know, with the UK, for example, I, I am positive. I'm not in the gloom and doom area, um, but then again, I'm not in the boom area. No, I think it's interesting as well. I mean, I heard somebody on the radio today saying that, you know, they're surprised that already the government hasn't had a campaign around you know, reducing energy usage and encouraging people to use a bit less, because that in itself would, would help things. But, but one thing that concerns me at the moment is, is that you know, for, for, for um, democratic reasons, we don't really have an active or functioning government at the moment, and there's a, there's a bit of stagnation. The area concerning me at the moment is the, the, the lack of um, price cap for businesses. You know, we're not just talking about large businesses, we're talking about the chip shop, the pub, you know, your local high street and everything else, which are, are the bedrocks of communities. And if they don't get some help with their energy bills, then I think we could see something quite nasty transpire. Um, you talk about in macro thoughts about a consultation for energy intensive industries. What the effect be on the support for those particular businesses, steel and things like that? And what would you do around smaller businesses? Well, I think, the, again, we're raising the interest rates, you know, four, five, six percent. Um, it will only add to the problems that the small businesses have. If you look at the US, for example, small business employment has been negative month on month for all but one month. And you know, while you're talking about strong employment, you know, there's, there's argue, there are under you know evidence that's not the data that doesn't always pick up, or is not an absolute true reflection of employment itself. In terms of uh, the energy issue, um, governments can borrow money for 10, 50 years. So, you know, if you're talking about a government can issue an energy bill, uh, uh, an energy bond, uh, and then pass that loan on to energy companies to cap uh, energy uh, price rises, let's say £2,000 rather than £5,000, that in itself will, will help across the board. And one of the Sunak issues was his, his policies tend to be more piecemeal. And even now there are those that, that should have received uh, a rebate based on, uh, on, the, on the spring budget on energy that are still not being paid yet because they're not on direct debits. Yeah. Uh, and the, the responsibility was placed on councils. Okay. Um, for me, if you can let the energy companies keep the cap, by lending them the money, 
Right, and 100 billion, if you base gilt rates at 4%, 100 billion uh, gilt on uh, gilt issuance uh, at 4% means that you're effectively, uh, the cost of interest is 4 billion, fine, that's one month's worth of government spending. But over the overall uh, benefits from that to businesses, to employment, to things like property, um, energy intensive industries such as agriculture and construction, um, then the, in, the benefit over the long run will be, will be there. And obviously these energy companies can recuperate their, the, the, the loan interest themselves um, over a period of time, gradually rising, raising prices rather than having a shock price rise. This is the Scottish power idea. Scottish power yeah. and energy, uh, uh, oxy, um, octopus, uh, I've been right. discussing this for a while. Um, I think it's, it's, it's got good legs and it makes sense. The alternative is, as I say, governments around the world start stamping down on energy prices, or as with the continent, um, you, start, you use your nationalisation of, of, of uh, energy companies to kick prices down, but effectively that just means the government covers the cost anyway. Mm. Uh, there are signs you know, around the world that, you know, in Asia for example, that energy prices are slowing, uh, food prices of, on a wholesale basis are lower, uh, and obviously you know, something like half of any food inflation is transport costs and, and, and the like, so energy becomes expensive itself. So you know, the, I'm optimistic that such a shock of five thousand pounds energy bills can be dealt with, and if that can be dealt with, then we can reverse the gloomy uh, scenarios that a lot of people are calling for at the moment. Yeah, you know, I'd like to see the government getting ahead of some of the stories, but I think that the reality is is that a lot of small businesses have come out of COVID with you know COVID loans, bills loans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera probably in debt, maybe from furlough and things like that. And, you know, they, they took those debts on in good faith, understanding that the lockdowns would be relatively short. And unfortunately, for, for reasons that we all understand, these lockdowns went on for an awful lot longer. So I think, you know, we need to get ahead of the story and help these smaller businesses in whatever way possible. Um, and how do you think employment's looking? Well, again, you know, em employment data um, looks positive, especially for the UK, and you've seen yourself over the last two years since COVID, um, the demand for workers, and Brexit's made a difference to the UK. Um, but equally, if you take the US data, which has got an unemployment rate of 3.6%, but the participation rate and the uh, employment to rate, uh, population ratio are very low. <clears throat> and when you talk about average earnings, um, because it's been, the lower paid hospitality, leisure, retail industries that are that have suffered then you know, average earnings will, will or I think those industries have been slower to come back on uh, or to recover from COVID. Um, then these these are the um, that distorts if you like the average overall um, average hourly earnings and, and if you look at weekly earnings they, they can be quite sketchy. It could be, it could be one or two industries that, that are making the difference. Um, I think overall though, the issue again is if we start seeing, for example, the property market people start to decelerate. A lot of movement in the UK was away from the cities and into the country or the coast. Uh, so prices have been uh, rising quite rapidly in you know, the West Country, for example, or Wales. Um, if we start getting high unemployment in those regions um, and, high, uh, and, and we start getting negative equity and things like that, then that's a hard, uh, hard turnaround for a, for a central bank to have, have progressed with higher interest rates to slow inflation when it's an energy issue. Uh, and then find that unemployment starts to rise, the property market starts to collapse, businesses start to start to crumble you know if, if we, we could end up with you know 30 40 percent of small businesses going bust if we if we're not careful <clears throat> and they're very hard to bring back again and you know, they've just suffered covid and and that and if, if you it's all right as, as a bank reducing your staff levels but as a business it's either 
be in business or, or not be in business. Interesting point. I've heard it made many a time that you know it's very difficult to build a business, but very easy to destroy one. So bringing them back can be quite difficult. I mean, we've seen huge labour shortages in financial services. I think an awful lot of it's driven by retirement, and hence why you're now seeing a skill shortage and therefore uplifts in salaries. But you're absolutely right. Other industries have really struggled, I think, to get themselves back up and running. What I'd like to see, I think, is a bit more kind of positivity and boosterism, if that's the right word, around we're on a current path but actually if we make some changes we might be able to change the outcomes a little bit i think there's too much as you say negativity around various issues but i think it's interesting around interest rates you know you're talking earlier on about supply side um, causes for inflation is raising interest rates going to do anything positive to fix the supply supply side issues and are we now starting to see it filter into house prices like you said and is it is there any change in the property markets that you've seen? Well, certainly, I think that if you if you start raising mortgages and, and rents go up the way they have in the US, they're up by 30, 40%, and in some cities, 50%. And, the, and these are massive rises. Um, and it's okay, the, the property market has benefited from, in the UK, from stamp duty changes and, and, and the likes. Um, but I think that, again, the nervousness could quickly change uh, we've seen, although you know, right, right with data and Halifax data may be slow and only just changing now, but we've seen evidence over the last three or four months that the property market has slowed down. Um, but then again, you know, if you talk about the UK property market, it had a really, really strong time coming out of COVID. Uh, and we, we speak to people on um, uh, in the west side of London, uh, pro uh, estate agents, and we've seen how much they've grown since you know, COVID in terms of employees, in terms of businesses, in terms of the size and the, the amounts of properties that we're going through. Um, and that, uh, on, equally, you know, if you look at the UK GDP in Q2, uh, it did dip into negative, but unlike US GDP, for example, where uh, inventory levels have, have, have boosted the, 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 the data, um, business investment in the UK was up three and a half percent and that's a positivity and maybe the UK property market will benefit from geopolitical risk coming out of you know the Far East maybe Taiwan uh, and other areas uh, so although there was the Brexit kind of gap um, I think that the property market has, has held up pretty well and you know, whereas it was the west coast uh, of, of, of the UK that, um, that benefited is now London and Birmingham and the, and the other areas that are the cities now that are doing well. Of course, the UK have benefited from uh, over the second quarter in June and July from you know, the European Championships uh, of football and Commonwealth Games uh, and the likes, which, you know, they have good positivities um, for hospitality trade. So employment is there, I think there's demand for workers, um, but you know you can't let energy prices blow that out of the water. You know, the recovery is there. Um, we don't know who's going to be running the government you know, in a month's time. Um, and I think there's still a, a certain amount of, of um, disappointment that Boris Johnson actually has actually left. So we need to see what, what policies are going to come through for the UK uh, and whether those policies are, are going to be changed or different to the ones that went through COVID. Mm. I think considering how unique the situation was around the pandemic, it's not something we've dealt with in modern times and, and considering the economic challenges that were thrown our way, we've actually come out of it in quite good shape and I think that we can probably look back, I think, with a bit of um, pride in how we came out of it, but obviously it's left us with huge challenges going forwards and and you know we, we had to deal with the awful uh, health risks first and but going forwards we do have some real challenges and i think now it's probably more crucial than ever that we make the right steps going forwards i mean i i personally can see a situation where um the employment the skill shortage eases a little bit as people are i'm afraid to say falls back into work because of the cost of living crisis you may find that a lot of people have retired um, 
unfortunately don't quite have the income they thought they had or the purchasing power they had and will come back into the market. And that will help industries, I think, that are struggling um, like leisure and, and, and hospitality, um, where they can't get enough staff and therefore that's limiting their ability to, you know, the restaurants do enough covers of an evening, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, but we've got to be very careful, I think, going forward. And I, I think a lot of smaller businesses would, would like to see a national insurance cut. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts and if that was to come in, into play, would, would that create inflation? I mean, there's all this talk about if you create tax cuts, mm. you could actually stoke inflation. It, is that real? Well, I think that the first thing to say is I think that the response to COVID was, was piecemeal and slow. You know that we talked about COVID in January 2020. Yeah. We talked about inflation in August 2020. We said in August uh, 2021, when Powell was still talking about transient inflation, we'd said six months before, this is not transient inflation, this is real inflation. And real inflation becomes entrenched when, when consumers, households believe in inflation. Um, if, for example, you're on Amazon and you think, well, I can buy it next week at the same price, you let it go. Um, if you can't afford it now, you just don't pay it. Uh, and I think one of the, one thing that the consumers have done, and I think that this is where the economies have, have, have developed over the last decade before COVID, when you come out of the financial crisis like the, that we had in 2008, it was left to consumers largely to change their lifestyles. So, you know, those going out to a restaurant every night was stopped. Having three cars was stopped. You had a development of home cinemas, Netflix, Amazon Prime, and then you had the development of uh, Deliveroo and, and Eating From Home. And that helped restaurants because if you're, you've got 20 tables, you now have the ability to serve the equivalent of 100 tables. So restaurants benefit from people actually working from home. Then you had the Lidl's and the Aldi's start to have an effect, the, the, the large discount supermarkets. So those had an effect over a decade, and, and that those were the lifestyle changes. You managed to continue, if you like, your life, but you made your the economies didn't make the same sort of changes. Coming now, or the, the at the point that we're at now, is different because you've already made those changes. You can make your economising. You can cut down the subscriptions and things like that, but you still have to pay your electricity. You still have to buy your food. And food banks are actually huge. And one of the noticeable things uh, of in the US, for example, was within a month of COVID lockdowns, you were seeing SUVs and the likes queuing up for food banks. And, and that's one of the issues now. It's all right, Sam, well, everyone's employed. Well, you know, if you've got 2 million people in the UK or 7% of the workforce on minimum wage, then you know, that doesn't feel like that you're about to go and buy a house, for example, or a new car. So that's an issue. And the UK, one of the reasons I think the UK can recover quicker than most, it doesn't rely on China because it's not manufacturing uh, in the same way. And it's a service industry. So, you know, there's certain things that encourage, you know, tourism and, and the likes, you know, and the holidays from abroad. Uh, one of the things that I do think with the raising of interest rates or is that we need to maintain a strong pound, not go down the route of Japan where you try and encourage trade. A strong pound will keep energy and inflation not capped, but it will help keep it capped. And noticeably, although we're talking about you know, weakness against the dollar, the dollar has been king. And the dollar will continue that way until the energy crisis ends, for example. But then you know, stock markets, the S&P have, have, have struggled. The FTSE's outperformed. Europe, for example, and it's outperformed. It hasn't got the tech, com uh, the tech companies in it. Having said that, the UK is now developing and moving on to new industries. The film industry is going to be a massive boost to the north of London, for example. And you, when you've got you know, new studios from Paramount and Sky and the rest, and there's studios being built in Birmingham. Now, these sort of growth areas and you know, tech areas. I know of a young company that, that um, invests uh, or it, it deals with, with, with the middleman in ad advertising for online games. 
So the big companies want to advertise on those online games. He knows where to go and who, how to do it. That company has just gone from there to there in two or three years. So that technology and that, that ability to build those industries need to be encouraged. And you know, again, if you're building studios, studios are energy using. So, but they also uh, are employers. They they will encourage foreign investment. And you know, we talk about, um, for example, the controversy of building a railway line from here to Birmingham, or the cross rail in London. Now, those industries or the knowledge gain from those industries mean that the UK has just signed a contract with Israel to build it in, in Tel Aviv. Now, the UK is one of the one of the uh, Tel Aviv's or Israel's biggest transport uh, hub providers, for example. Now, these are industries that can be growth and built on. It means that you can deal with those sort of th these sort of things, but only if the investment's there. So, a strong pound will keep in encouraging investment, not just in the property market, but in the industries that are, that can grow from that. And I think you know your point about service-based economy is very important because you can pivot the service-based economy very quickly to react to market conditions. Yeah. And the other point that I'd make as well is is that we see with the fintech clients that we work with, there's a huge potential for employment that those companies offer. And where we need to get good, I think, in the UK is taking those businesses from being you know, proof of concept to established business to the to trying to get to that unicorn status. How do we nurture and put the right um, uh, steps in place to help companies do that and support them along the way? So, um, yeah, lo lots to be positive about. Keith, I could talk to you all day. Thank you very much for um, taking the time to talk to me today. If there are any issues that you'd like to flood with Keith, then please don't hesitate to contact me and I can connect you in the future. Um, but until next time, Keith, thank you very much. Thank you.